I'm just going to introduce Evelyn Lake. Um, she's an assistant professor in the Department of Radiology and Biomedical Imaging at Yale University. She started her research career at the University of Guelph in Ontario before earning a PhD from the University of Toronto in medical biophysics in 2016. Um, her applications are on multimodal imaging of a rodent model of focal ischemic stroke during her PhD. And her research now combines multimodal fMRI and calcium wide field imaging uh, to better understand the neurovascular underpinnings of neurological disorders. By merging these modalities, she's able to simultaneously acquire whole brain fold and whole cortex calcium sensitive fluorescent measures um, in order to characterize processes that govern brain function in health and disease. And today she's going to be talking about the application of those techniques in order to look at brain networks. And um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Evelyn. I don't see her, but she should be here. Oh, can you hear me at least? Perfect, yep, awesome. I see you now. Okay, uh, so yes, uh, thank you very much for that introduction um, and also for the invitation. Um, as I said, when we were sort of chatting at the beginning, it's really awesome to be able to do this anytime with people who are anywhere. So look on the bright side, I guess. Um, so in preparation for today, I watched some of the previous event um, on YouTube, which is awesome um, to get a sense for the flavor. And before um, I go much further, um, I have a small disclaimer. I'm not currently a bona fide layer fMRI person, but I think we can get along anyway, because I'm really interested in the links between neurons, other brain cells, blood vessels, and the fMRI signal. Um, and as mentioned in uh, the kind introduction you gave, um, the way I go about this is by developing multimodal imaging tools. So today I plan to give a fairly introductory talk um, about multimodal approaches in general, uh, then focus on what my group does more specifically. And hopefully this will set the stage from, for a uh, hopefully not too heated, but definitely interesting discussions about how we can use these tools um, for layer specific fMRI questions. So since every talk needs a title, uh, mine is leveraging simultaneous multimodal fMRI and wide field optical imaging to study brain function. Um, but the short version, um, as Amir suggested, it's a great idea to simplify one's, one's talk right before um, to develop tools to take a multi-pronged approach. So a few weeks ago, I had the pleasure of attending uh, the PhD defense of a friend and colleague, and uh, defense is a great time to sort of zoom out and really think, um, what do we do and why do we do it? Um, so to motivate his uh, thesis, um, which was another multimodal imaging project, he uh, told a little story, which I'm going to also tell you guys, which I think is fantastic for setting the stage. Um, so the tale is uh, the blind men and the elephant, or as I prefer it. Uh, the blind, precocious postdocs and the elephant. So a lot of you I'm sure are familiar with stories, so I'll briefly describe it. You have one scientist who examines one part of an elephant, the trunk, and while unable to observe the rest of the creature, they conclude based on what they can see that the elephant is very snake-like. Um, then you have a second scientist come along and examine another part of uh, the creature and they see the leg and they conclude that, of course, an elephant is tree-like. So these observations are clearly irreconcilable. So the scientists argue, accuse one another of falsified data, et cetera, et cetera. However, if both of them could zoom out and somehow overlap their observations, they would eventually be able to see what an elephant actually looks like. So this is a great metaphor, in my opinion, um, but we're, for what we're trying to accomplish with multimodal imaging methods. Only we're looking at brain function, not at elephants. Um, so brain function on uh, evidence of its organization is found across spatial and temporal scales at the level of a single neuron um, or even a synapse belonging to that neuron. We have um, the ability to observe with exquisite detail, as Amir was showing us as, uh, in his last talk, evidence of a system at work. However, this neuron exists as a little sophisticated unit within a soup of other cell types, including neurons, glia, astrocytes, pericytes, blood vessels. And together, these give rise to another level of functional organization that we can look at with some predictability. Um, and this provides a beautiful little window into the brain, but the brain itself shows an organ level set of organizing principles through circuits, networks. And further, this brain as an organ doesn't exist in isolation. It's housed within an animal that 
contains multiple interdependent systems, which together give rise to a complex but still somewhat organized set of behaviors. Now, these components and organizing principles in this mouse example share, we hope, at least some overlap with ourselves, our brains, and how we function within a population. So we have a whole bunch of tools to interrogate brain function um, that operate at different spatial temporal scales and within different species. However, they're all highly specialized and as such offer a limited view of the complete whole. So bridging some of these gaps um, between modalities uh, can be helped by use, utilizing simultaneous multimodal imaging. Um, and this can help us, we hope, obtain a perspective that can link some of these disparate spatial temporal, spatial uh, measurements together, which will help us better understand how the brain works, uh, both in health and in disease. So before I zero in on our work, I want to highlight um, a small handful of multimodal methods in general. And I've chosen these just for the purposes of illustrating the landscape. So both humans and uh, animal models uh, can undergo simultaneous fMRI and elective physiology to an extent. Um, and this can allow you to look at multi-unit activity um, and organ level function. So uh, you can also have simultaneous electrophysiology as well as two photon microscopy, um, which has been implemented to examine multi-unit or single unit activity as well as neuroglyovascular function within a few cubic millimeters of tissue. Um, given the invasiveness though of two photon microscopy, these methods are uh, somewhat limited in terms that they can be used in non-human primates or in DNA rodents. And finally, to sort of close this circle, we have one photon or wide field microscopy, which measures cortical activity um, and has been combined with all the aforementioned uh, methodologies to examine circuit and network level function. So notably, these modes, starting from electrophysiology to fMRI and going clockwise, um, have been implemented, uh, but they have differences in terms of the amount of brain coverage and the amount of the spatial temporal resolution. So some of these implementations, such as EFIS and fMRI, have been implemented more prevalently. Um, others, such as simultaneous one and two photon microscopy, are much more rare. Um, and also uh, one photon imaging, as well as fMRI, which I'm going to focus on, is somewhat rare. So different modes offer different insight into facets of brain function. And there are several layers of complexity um, that must be considered when you're aiming to conduct dual mode experiments. And that's what I'm going to briefly outline in the next little bit. So when combining any pair of modes, one has to consider the following. You have to consider your species. Can one mode be applied um, in one or more species? For example, optical imaging methods, as I said, are limited based on the invasiveness of the manipulations, um, either to express the fluorophore or to gain optical access to the tissue, spatial temporal scale, how easy or hard is it to overlap across modes, coverage is your mode one, two, or three dimensional. This will affect how do you register the, your data, and I'll come back to that. Sources of contrast, are they few or many? How specific are they? Are the modes complementary? Do they measure the same or different aspects of brain function? Sources of noise, are they same or different um, across the modes that you're choosing? Uh, will you need to implement one, your, will what you need to implement one mode cause noise in another? And can you come up with a solution in that case? And finally, what are the methodological requirements of each mode and, you can, and can you satisfy them all simultaneously? Um, what might you have to compromise on? So for the remainder of this talk, um, I'm going to use uh, our simultaneous uh, imaging methods, simultaneous fMRI and one photon or wide field microscopy, just uh, illustrate some of the more specific problems that you can run into when you have uh, these two modes in combination. So when we started uh, putting this together, we immediately had a bunch of problems at the acquisition uh, phase. So first, surgery. To perform wide field imaging, you require optical access to the entire cortical surface, and you need to gain this without causing horrendous susceptibility artifacts in your fMRI data. Equipment, you need to merge the optical equipment with the uh, MRI scanner, and the optical equipment has several MR unsafe components. The milieu, um, typically wide field imaging is performed in awake running animals, whilst the majority of fMRI data are acquired in anesthetized and immobilized animals. So which paradigm should we choose to go with? Um, recording parameters. How long should our scans be? How do we synchronize our recordings? How would we stimulate our animals? And importantly, when you're combining these different modes, often you make completely different choices when you were using one or the other independently. So the challenges 
clearly continue when you get to analyze your data. How do we tackle multimodal data registration? Should we analyze the data in individual or common space? If it's in common space, what space should that be and how do we get there? Um, 2D versus 3D problems, um, overlapping or completely different spatial temporal scales. Um, data pre-processing. How do you do motion correction in multimodal data? Do you do it in each mode independently? Do you use the parameters for one on the other? Uh, which nuisance, nuisance variable should you regress and it should be from one or both? How do you normalize? Should you harmonize your data in some way? And what exclusion criteria should you be using? Okay, so throwing a ton of questions out there just to sort of illustrate the landscape that we're, we're working in. Uh, and for the remainder of this talk, I'm gonna try and focus on some of the answers that we've come up for these questions. Um, however, that being said, this is all work in progress um, and input from this crowd would be really, really neat to have. Um, and after that, I'm going to focus on with the remaining few minutes, I hope, uh, some of the applications that we're actively working on. So, but before I do that, um, I should take a tiny step back and introduce one photon wide build imaging really quickly. So to collect these data, um, we introduced genetically encoded or virally mediated fluorescence indicators such as DCAMP uh, into the mouse brain. And these indicators can be targeted to a specific cell type um, and thus provide a means of measuring cell type specific activity. So with this mode, we can measure concert activity from across the cortical mantle. Um, and these uh, data are acquired through an optically transparent um, but intact skull. So this movie is played back in real time. Um, it shows what these data look like. This is uh, blooms of activity appearing in hot colors against a cool background. And um, they're typically acquired using a schematic, something like this, where the mouse is secured underneath an objective, the excitation at light comes in from a pop, uh, above, goes through a dichroic mirror, and then the signal or the fluorescence is redirected off to a camera. So our goal, as I've said, was to get this somehow inside our 11.7 our .7 Tesla MRI scanner. And to do this, the schematic we came up with uh, was as follows. So in the room neighboring the magnet, we house the camera, computer, all the really incompatible components. And we use a 15 foot long fiber optic bundle and liquid light guide to relay the excitation light and transmission um, light back out of the scanner. So a photograph of the business end of the device that actually inserts into the magnet is shown here. Um, and I can open it up to show you guys the light path um, where we have the excitation light coming in the bottom, getting redirected onto the prism and then to the mouse signal, similarly redirected back out and through our fiber optic bundle. Um, so this bundle is really key. It consists of about 2 million uh, individual fibers um, that give us a field of view about one and a half centimeters cube. Um, and to collect these data, as I've said, we have a surgical preparation, which uh, is shown in the photograph here, uh, which is composed of glass and glue um, with a double dovetail that fits snugly into our in-house built RF coil, which is the saddle coil. Um, constructed so that it doesn't obstruct our optical field of view and also stops a uh, horrible signal dropout in the deeper parts of the brain. Okay, so with all this, we can acquire these simultaneous data, but we still have a little ways to go. Um, so we want to move this data to common space. On the one hand, we have our mesoscale fluorescence imaging data, which is in two, two dimensions, whilst on the other hand, we have our 3D fMRI data. So I've included some example movies of our gradient echo data here. Um, both in axial and coronal directions. This is the same mouse, uh, same data set. So taking a single image from our fluorescence uh, time series, we can clearly see some large blood vessels, some of which are running across the cortical surface, others are within the skull or the dura overlying the brain since it's intact. Uh, so using the time of flight uh, MR angiogram, we can also capture an image of the vascular anatomy in 3D. This is a maximum intensity projection of this 3D data. And to make it look more like the optical data, we use a ray casting algorithm that adds some shading um, to make the MR data look like what a two dimensional from above view would be. So this nicely highlights the blood vessels that run along the cortical surface in the MRI data. Notably in both of these images, we can see um, the middle cerebral arteries crawling across uh, the top of the cortex. And we use these as anatomical landmarks to move the calcium and MRI data into the same space. So all these operations are done within BioImage Suite, which is developed in-house by Dr. Puppet uh, Amitris. Um, and they're also freely available online. Um, so there's a great versatility in that tool set. Um, however, with these uh, 
this particularly hard transformation in hand, we still have a little ways to go to get actually our fMRI data into the same space as our optical data. So in addition to the angiogram and fluorescence imaging data, we acquire isotropic high resolution anatomical images of the whole brain. Um, and thus the fMRI data, which covers most of the brain is registered to these anatomical data in two steps. The first of which with a high in-plane resolution, but through plane matching prescription uh, anatomical image and the second being the, the uh, isotropic uh, anatomical image. Now we also have um, a reference space, which we've created from about 162 mice that have been nonlinear registered together and also registered to a common reference space from the Allen Institute. Um, so with this all in hand, um, we can move the fluorescence imaging data and our fMRI data to either individual space, which is a multimodal common space for one mouse or to group common space. And likewise, we can move the data from the Allen Institute to the native MR space and individual mouse space, the native fluorescence space using a projection. Um, and again, this is all done in bioimage suite. Um, so you can test it all and try it all yourselves if you, if you so choose. Um, and uh, with this sort of experimental framework in hand, uh, I'm gonna go to sort of the experimental repertoire wish list we came up with sort of right before the pandemic hit. Um, so this is what we've been working on most recently. Um, so we wanted to first increase the number of different cell types we can image with our simultaneous fMRI and wide field imaging setup. So until recently, we've been imaging either all neurons with a pan-neuronal marker um, or excited to neurons. So both of these options have high optical SMR. And we wanted to investigate uh, whether we could reliably image more sparse cell populations with dimmer fluorescence signals. Um, next, we wanted to move from our original acute surgical preparation to a longitudinal protocol where we could collect multi-session data. Um, so in this experiment, we wanted to find out sort of how long we could go with the surgical prep. Um, and this would open doors for us, including the next item, which is we wanted to move from anesthetized experiments to awake imaging. So in addition, we wanted to find a way of collecting data from more than one cell type simultaneously. And finally, we wanted to find a way of introducing fluorescence in more complex genetic models of disease um, where the genetically encoded fluorescence markers become a bit cumbersome to add on top of uh, these uh, other, uh, other components. So, okay, I'm gonna focus on the first two. Um, so expanding the number of cell types uh, we can image in the scanner and moving to a longitudinal imaging protocol. So for these experiments, we included five groups of mice, um, each with, with a different genetically encoded GCAMP fluorescence indicator. So one for astrocytes or glia, one for pervalbumin interneurons, the same excitatory neural marker that I mentioned before, uh, uh, here and called, I'm going to call it SLC, um, an inhibitory neuron marker called SOM for somatostatin, a sec and a second interneuron marker VIP for stands for vasoactive intestinal peptide expressing. So each group is comprised of about 10 animals and all of them underwent head implant procedures at about two months of age. Following this, they were allowed to recover and then were imaged three times using our multimodal imaging setup uh, at weekly intervals. So to briefly touch on uh, these different markers, I'm gonna show you some of the uh, open source data from the Allen Institute. Uh, so for three of these five cell specific markers, the Allen Institute has performed basic histology experiments. So first the excitatory marker or SLC that shows high expression levels um, and therefore is the brightest in all our experiments. Um, next, they've also looked at SOM, which is uh, our first interneuron subtype and it shows a lower expression level, um, therefore less optical signal about a little, uh, call it a third. Um, and finally, VIP, which is the second interneuron subtype, which shows the lowest expression levels down to about a quarter. So this gives us sort of breadth of what we're looking at. It also is maybe the most layer specific slide that I've got. Um, so we can get into that in the discussion point um, as we move forward. The other two we haven't characterized yet with histology and there isn't any open source data on it, um, but I'll get to the good stuff right now. So here we have it. Uh, we're in the throes of analyzing this data set. It's a massive amount of data, especially considering how, uh, high, how much uh, calcium data we've acquired in these mice. Um, but here's some of the earliest results. So the first conclusion is we're able to image all of these cell types uh, using our multimodal approach. And for brevity, I'm gonna just show the two groups here, maybe the most interesting to the folks uh, on this uh, Zoom. So astrocytes and mice with uh, excitatory neurons. So the top row shows three different mice from the astrocyte or glia group. 
Um, these recordings are done in scanner with simultaneous fMRI data being acquired. Each movie is looping. Um, it's uh, over about a minute, um, but it's sped up two and a quarter times, uh, all of them. So they are looking at about four minutes of data. Um, and the second row shows the excitatory neurons. Um, now it's really tempting to try and look at these two simultaneously. Um, however, they're all acquired in different mice at this point. Um, so, and also I'll, I'll note that these are all from the third imaging time point. So this is 21 days after uh, the surgery and after two previous uh, imaging sessions. So there are many ways about uh, going about to how to go about analyzing these data. And we're exploring a bunch of different avenues right now, but I'm, in the interest of time, I'm gonna highlight one quick example here. Um, driving cell type specific bold to calcium fluorescence transfer functions. So for this analysis, we average the signal within the Allen at, within Allen Atlas regions, which I'm showing here. So to do this, um, we wanted to try and match the physical tissue as best we could by back projecting the two dimensional uh, regions in the calcium space onto the 3D fMRI space. Now I can go into how we wrestled with how much depth to go to, go to so on and so forth, um, but we'll save that for the discussion. So. Uh, all right, uh, one plot here. So for a random region in mouse um, and 50 seconds, I'm plotting the calcium time course of uh, one of these glia animals in green and the corresponding bold signal in orange. You can see that they're notably fairly correlated. Um, and for a second mouse, um, for a second example, we see something quite similar. Um, so we were able to use these data to extrapolate uh, cell type specific transfer function. Use a gamma variant fitting approach, um, which we've published previously, and just taking the data from uh, also an excitatory cell uh, group of animals here. Uh, shown in purple, we have the astrocyte data given uh, transfer function average across five mice and an excitatory neuron one for six. So although this is very preliminary, it has us excited. Um, however, uh, there's still a lot to tease out in this data, and I'll be I'll, I'll highlight one one thing we're working on right now is that although we do see plots like the ones I've highlighted um, at the bottom, we also see epochs like this at the top where you actually have significant anti-correlation between these two signals. Um, so teasing out um, when you have activity behaving like the top or the bottom, the physical uh, location of this, the frequency at which it happens, um, all of this we're trying to characterize. Um, and any thoughts on this would be really welcome. So work in progress. Uh, so to quickly come back to the, the wish list here, whoop, we're checking out the first two items and going to the next slide, sorry. Um, so early in this presentation, I mentioned that we can use both genetically encoded markers as well as vir virally mediated, for, mediated fluorescence. Um, so until now, we've been using genetically encoded markers um, because they offer a really nice uniform expression um, versus viral injections um, that traditionally have a significant gradient associated with them um, and are not great if you wanna look at say the whole cortical field of view. However, um, a colleague of ours has come up with a really um, great solution to this problem uh, that he's published recently. And I'm just gonna go over it super quick here. So within 24 hours of birth, blood brain barriers underdeveloped in the mouse pup. Thus with a minimally invasive injection right through the soft skull um, and into the transverse sinuses, you can get this beautiful distribution of your virus. And actually by early in development, it goes right across the brain uh, really nicely. So this is an extremely useful technique um, that we've adopted in the lab. And it has uh, very exciting imp uh, implementations that I'm happy to discuss uh, further. Uh, so one of which that we've been working on um, is introducing an option which we can use to excite. Um, so using light to drive cell type specific activity, uh, which has been injected here. And you can see the histological results shortly after. Um, however, we've also used this to introduce a second fluorophore um, into a mouse that already has a genetically encoded marker. And finally, we've also used it in um, a transgenic model, um, here being a double knock-in um, Alzheimer's disease model. So these animals at three months of age then underwent our head implant uh, surgery and at five months were imaged. And you can see um, in this movie here that's minimally pre-processed that in these 80 animals that we did these transverse sinus injections, we still have really nice uh, fluorescent signal. Um, so this has us quite excited. Um, and with these animals, we started working on the final component, which is our awake imaging protocol that all I have right now is a cartoon, I'm afraid, but 
we've basically gone through and introduced these animals to an extensive training protocol um, where we do handling, um, restraint stress. Uh, we expose them to the calcium imaging light and we also expose them to scanner noise. And then we do two in-scanner sessions um, of awake imaging acquisition. So we've done this at about six months of age in this group. Um, and next week we're actually acquiring a second awake imaging time point um, at 12 months of age. So our implants have lasted that long, which we're very happy about. Okay, I'm well over time. So I'm gonna cross off the final item here. And I'd like to say thank you um, to everybody in the radiology department who's helped with this work, the machine shop folks who've been fantastic, neuroscience people, modeling people, hydrocephalus, which I didn't get to, um, and also TBI, but uh, the AD folks as well. So it's a collective effort for sure. And thank you all for your attention um, and being interested in inviting me to come and play with uh, in the uh, layer fMRI sandbox, so to speak. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. It's a very, very nice walkthrough of, of the challenges that go into these types of measurements.